This is about premium rail steels and why harder isn't always better. And hopefully I will answer that question, or Steve and I will answer that question. So London Underground, uh, Mind the Gap, our iconic theme. Uh, it's a very curvy railway, that's the short answer. Um, this is taken uh, Paddington southbound platform of the Bakerloo line. So you can see not only have we got lots of very tight curves, but they're also through platforms. This is the real map, if anybody wants to be interested in it. We're going to talk about some of these curves, this one especially. So I won't give it away, but yeah, it's very curvy. Just some numbers there. That's a kind of radius of mainline curves uh, by total kilometerage and percentage. But basically, 17% of the mainline is under 400 meters in radius. So it is tight. Um, and what this presentation is really all about is about the battle that we have in the wheel rail contact between Ware and RCS. Um, so these two photos are taken on two curves in different tunnels, one where the lubricator was working and one where it wasn't. I don't think you need too much instruction to guess which is which, but we have RCF cracks or we have very high adhesion and high wear rates. So that's really the battle that we're looking at and what we were looking to achieve with premium rail steels. Um, so generically improved in about 2016, following all you know standard welding tests, which we're not going to go into. Um, but effectively, it was taken on a cross approval from Network Rail, uh, which Steve is going to talk about in a bit more detail. Um, when it went in, we sort of knew where a number of selected sites were, despite me asking, please tell me if you put some in, because I would like to know what it's doing. But we had enough sites that you know, we were monitoring them through um, for profile using Miniprof, which we can talk about, and also through magnetic particle inspection for visual RCF. And also they were being monitored as per normal through normal NDT processes of ultrasonics and RFCM, which is our rail surface crack measuring system, which measures RCF depths. So yeah, 2016 is approved, and on the 26th of February 2018, this is what I woke up to, a photo sent through to my emails. Um, this is, yeah, Liverpool Street to Bethel Green on the central line, uh, a broken rail in HP. One thing you will notice, it's also on a track system called Pandrel Vanguard, um, and again, we'll talk a bit more about that, but it's a very vertically soft track form. Um, lots of issues with corrugation in this area, which I need a whole other hour for, so I'm not going to go into, but that's why it was put in. Low rail of a 400 meter radius curve and detected through the signaling system. One of the, it's one of the lines where you still have a signaling current in the rail, so it tells you that you might have a broken rail. Um, none of us like broken rails. First rule of broken rails is you don't talk about the number of broken rails, so I'm not going to talk about it because we get to the end of every year and we just say quietly, yes, we're very happy it's in single figures. Um, but vertically, broken rails like that are actually, as a you know, permanent way engineer, you should be far more comforted by that than this, which is every one of these marks is an ultrasonically detected crack, over two and a half meters, uh, up to 21 mil in depth off the top of my head, but Steve's going to talk about that. And this is really where we woke up. It was found ultrasonically, you can see it was clamped and the speed put on. Fortunately, where it is between Cannon Street and Mansion House, it's probably quicker to walk. I wouldn't get the train. So a 10 mile an hour speed restriction really, you know, fortunately, those at the top weren't so bothered. But yeah, this is the one where I really did wake up. It's my mate Brian's foot um, saying, oh, what is this? And that's where we kind of went back to British Steel and said, we think this might be a more serious problem than we first thought. And that is where I'm going to hand over to Steve. And I'll be back at the end. But thanks. Right. Uh, thanks, Andy. Um, so first job done. I didn't follow up the stairs. Um, right. Now, there we go. So I want. I want you. It's getting going to get technical from now on. Okay. Um, I was going to say there'll be an exam after this, but someone stole my thunder on that. So. Uh, right, so let's get straight to it. So these are um, electron micrographs of um, politic rail steel. So most rail steel that we use around the world is, is politic, and this is what perlite looks under that looks like under the microscope. Um, so these white bands that you see here are called ferrite, um, and they're, they're more or less pure iron. And they're combined with these dark bands here, which are uh, cementite, which is a combination of iron and carbon in a, in, a, um, in a compound. 
And, and the, the oh, wrong button. Um, the way that this this works and what gives rail its its unique wear properties is these two phases of material work together a bit like the yin and the yang. Um, there we go. That's better. Um, and yeah, it's, it's it's kind of like a, a yin and yang relationship. Um, giving you the, the best properties of the rail. Now, what happens with HP335 is we get a finer spacing in between those two compounds, and that gives it the um, more the higher uh, the lower wear rate and the, the greater resistance to RCF. Um, so, before I go into the nitty gritty detail of what happened at London Underground, I'd like to just go through a couple of success stories of what HP does on the mainline network, on network rail. Um, so, we've got the first example here is from a place called Network Rail up in the north, north of England. And a long story short, when R260 was installed on, on, the, on the network, so R260 is the standard grade, kind of the softer, softer rail. Um, we were getting a rail life of about five years, and, and, and basically the RCF cracks got too, too long, and the rail needed to be replaced approximately every five years. Um, we put the HP335 in, and we've got an estimated, looking at the wear rate, uh, got an estimated 29-year rail life out of that site. So by using the correct grade of rail, you can extend your asset life by quite a considerable margin. Um, another case at Shipley, and again, I'll just cut straight to the chase. When we had R260 and before, we were looking at two-year rail life. We are now looking at around about a 12-year rail life, but that 12 years is already, we're already there. So we need to go, and, and from talking to Network Rail, that rail is still in service and they're still happy with it. So we need to go back out and re redo our calculations. So coming back to the rail that Andy showed you earlier, um, this is what we wrong button again. Um, this is what we received. Um, the sample that we received here. Sorry, this is a bit of a blurred picture, but um, what you could see on this rail was a, a series of cracks that almost looked like somebody had taken a bandsaw and, and cut down the longitudinal, uh, the, the transverse section of the rail. We'd not seen anything like this before. First thing we wanted to do was break the rail open, so we, we took it up to our T-side facility where we've got, um, we can cool it down in liquid nitrogen, um, cooled it down to minus 80, put it in a three-point press, and this was the resulting crack that we saw here. So when Andy was saying it was it was deep, um, it definitely was. This is about 40 millimetres deep. So that, that is a big, a big crack in a rail. Now, testament to the HP is that this rail didn't break in service. It was probably close to breaking. But I think when you've got such a big crack in a rail that's, that's stressed, um, the, the ability of the HP to withstand that just gave Andy and his team enough time to be able to re react to it before it was actually a broken rail. So we're scratching our heads at this point, and then this, this, the story just got even more scary when we started looking at the microscope. Um, to see these vertical cracks. So this is the longitudinal length of the rail. So this is the direction that the trains are running. And this is looking at the crown, uh, the, the material below the crown of the rail. And you see these vertical cracks. Now, up to this point, I'd not seen vertical cracks before. So typical rolling contact for fatigue cracks in a rail will grow at a very shallow angle um, like this. So that the longer they get, they don't necessarily get deeper um, too quickly. Um, so we were scratching our heads, thinking, I've not seen anything like this before, what's going on? And then lo and behold, kind of two examples came along at the same time. So I was at a conference um, in Delft back in 2018, and I saw this picture here um, from one of the presenters. Now, this is from a North American heavy hole um, situation, and lo and behold, they're getting some vertical cracks. So I'm thinking... That's good, good for us. It's not a necessarily a HP problem. This has been seen before. And we also saw them on this example here um, as well. So this is a, a European light metro system where they were used. And now, both of these are heat-treated premium rail grades. So this is giving us some more confidence now that it's not just a problem that 
was, was with our product, uh, British Steel. Um, so one of, the, one of the things I said to Andy early on in this investigation back in 2018 was um, what we really need to see is, is how is R260 performing under the similar situations. So we had to, Andy said, yeah, that's fine. You'll just have to wait two years because obviously you've got to put the rail in track and then let trains run over it. Um, so that is the R260 there. And there's another R260 sample here. And what you can see is we're seeing vertical cracks. Now, there is differences between these. But again, this is another kind of confidence that it's not just a premium rail problem. It seems to be looking from that previous slide that if you do get cracks on the head of the rail, on the crown, you do tend to get these vertical cracks. Now, we've also got HP installed at a heavy haul location. So these are where we're running at maximum axle loads up to 25 tonnes, laden trains carrying coal come into the site. Um, and this is what the rail here, and this is HP335, this is what this rail looked like. And lo and behold, again, we're seeing vertical cracks on the crown of the rail. And there is, you know, there's been no issues with the rail at, at this site. The, the customer's more than happy with the performance they're getting there um, on that. And this is a location on London Underground where the HP is still in service and it's actually performing quite well. And part of the reason because of that is, is it's, in, it's installed on this curve here, which is called Caxton Curve. So it comes out of the White City Depot and goes towards Shepherd's Bush Station. Now, looking again at these rails under the microscope, you can see that there isn't any cracks. Um, but you, you can't quite see from these um, pictures, there's, there's a layer of plastic deformation at the surface. Um, and what we believe here is because the rail is see receiving so much hammer on this curve, because it's such a, a tight radius, the, the rail is wearing fast enough that the cracks are disappearing. So the cracks are not having chance to grow because they're being worn away. Um, so HP has actually been put under its ideal environment that it likes, it's, it likes a nice high wear environment to, to be in. And this just concludes, really, the, the point that I, I tried to make here. So um, if we look at 260-grade rail, um, you can see from this photo that you get a plastic deformation layer at the surface. And what happens is when a crack forms in the rail, the crack seems to be constrained by the, um, the direction of the plastic deformation. Now, with a harder rail, with premium, more premium rails, that layer is thinner and therefore the crack's not as, not as constrained for as long. And you, you can kind of see that from this bar chart here. So the 260 cases, you've got a 200 micron layer, deep layer, and in the, the premium rail cases, your, your deformation layer is much, is much more shallow. Um, and just to give you an idea here of the four different rails that we looked at and, and some of the, the different wear rates that we're looking at. So this is the original rail that Andy sent us. Um, and this is the rail from the Caxton curve, and you can just see the different, the, the, the much higher difference in wear between the two scenarios. So this is the point where I hand back over to Andy. Yeah, thanks, Steve. Just to give you some context. That Cannon Street site is about a 200 meter radius curve, and Cannon Street is about 70 meters. So it really is where we are in the scales of very, very tight curves. Right, so some of the other part, we've been looking at you know, the original whole life rail model, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with in terms of comparing our RCF predictions versus those out of you know, similar studies. Um, I'm not gonna go into too much detail, but basically this is T gamma on the X axis. This is all the energy in the contact patch, simplest way of thinking about it. More energy in the contact patch and what this says is for R260, you have to reach a certain threshold. And then past that threshold, you start to generate RCF cracks. Where this starts to turn down is where wear starts to become more involved rather than just crack development. And if you're in the negative area, you should just be in the wear zone. Um, similar triangles were kind of developed for HP335. Uh, if you want to read some more about that, that's all in that paper. Um, 
And we were trying, part of this paper, part of this study was to validate some of those with, you know, the problem with some of the original network rail sites is they're all down here, whereas we're up here. So it's good to validate that whole model by using some sites that are in different ends of the triangle. The other key thing that is, um, we can talk about is how the direction of those forces also impacts on your RCF development. So in the original work, there was some uh, development around how you um, scaled that T gamma rather than having these raw numbers. But one of the things that's key is what the most RCF formula, and this is backed up by twin disk testing, is that it has to be in the traction direction, i.e. it has to be going forward. If it's going in reverse, then you start to get RCF on wheels. Because, and that, as I say, if you look at twin disk testing, that's why you only get cracks on one disk, because it has to be in the right direction. So this is just a very quick summary. This is some of that applied to SDOC, which runs on, um, runs on the district line. And this is effectively, this is radius of curvature getting tighter. And this is the predicted damage factor for HP for those curves for the leading wheel set and the trailing wheel set. So what you see in the leading wheel set, which is where you would get, you know, what we would call your classic RCF gauge corner um, cracking, is that even with no applied traction, the tighter we get, we should get to a point where we're reaching that peak and then we start to dip below the line. But this green one is applied with applied traction, i.e. motoring applied to the wheel set. And you can see it makes it a completely different ball game, really. However, what we're still saying with HP is that we're in the wear zone for that leading axle, but this trailing axle, which again, we could show through the simulations, the contact on that center of the railhead in those very tight curves is coming from this trailing wheel set. And what these simulations show is that until you apply any traction, you shouldn't get any RCF. So we are applying a lot of traction. Why are we applying a lot of traction? Because it's now a CBTC railway and it is always applying traction or braking. It is never just in rolling contact. So that's the modeling. Modeling looks good. How does it look for actual rails? Well, here's some tip. I mean, Steve showed you lots. These are actually 260 rails, but again, this is from a number of other sites we've got where this one on the left is from a 400 meter radius curve, typical gauge corner cracking, but nothing in the center of the railhead. It's a 200 meter radius curve where in that gauge corner, we're just wearing it away, but we're getting those trailing axle generating all these cracks in the center of the railhead, which are the ones that are turning down. Other thing we did at the time was, as I said, one of the original rail break was on a system called Pandrel Vanguard. That's designed to be very vertically soft, so we thought, well, how soft is it? Um, and we went and did some instrumentation, which you can see here, some potentiometers to measure the actual vertical deflection, which is what's shown. It's shown in time because this is a train passing over. So the red one is from that, uh, from Pandrel Vanguard site, which as you'd expect, much more vertical displacement, much softer, about three mil. But from the Canna Street site, we're getting about one mil. But as Steve put up in one of the corner of his slides, what we think is happening is when you are Talking about crack initiation, you're talking about all those contact stresses, energy in the contact patch. When you're talking about crack growth, you're really talking about bending stresses in the rail. So as soon as you start putting more bending stress in the rail, you drive the crack growth. Um, and yeah, whether they are softer track form probably will be quicker. That's the kind of conclusion at this stage. Also, one interesting thing about all, and you see this in most rail deflections, is the negative actually shows the rail bouncing back up. So if those cracks are in compression at all times, it's going to be slower than if they start going into tension. So through that cycle, we think that's influencing how the cracks were growing. This is a in the Cannon Street site. We also had some 400 HT, which we were looking to trial. And I sat and had many debates with a number of people about whether we should put it back in the same curve or that we should put it in a different curve. And I said, nope, I'm going to be brave. We're going to put it in the same curve, and I'm expecting it to fail in exactly the same way, which it did. This is 400 HT, so a heat-treated rail. Very similar, but yeah. It kind of confirmed to us that premium rail, all premium rails are not going to work in these very tight curves for us. So um, that's really a... Summary of everything I've said, as I say, we were kind of modeling looks good. That thin deformation layer, if we're running a heavy haul railway with 50 ton axle loads, probably controlling it through our deformation layer or at least buying yourself time that we don't have when we're talking about eight ton axle loads versus 25 ton axle loads. That's the difference. Um, vertical deflection seems to have an influence um, on the sites. It's still in a number of places, but 
under very tight controls, Caxton being the best example. And you know, I, I can testify that rail used to get changed every year. It now lasts every, it now lasts four years. So I'm not arguing about the where or the RCFs. Um, performance at all is just a particular quirk of our railway. Um, and really, the point of this presentation about kind of sustainability is, you know, obviously we were hoping that we would get more life out of our rails by using premium rail steels. But clearly, given our unique situation, um, we have quite a few issues and it doesn't necessarily work everywhere. Um, and there uh, is a paper that was presented at the World Congress of Railway Research if you want to get even more technical. But um, uh, yeah, I look forward to your questions at the end. But thank you very much.